Greetings, Sunrise Church family and friends from around the corner and around the world. Uh, it is a special morning. Uh, we come to celebrate the most important, significant day in the history of the world. And some of you may say, well, how, how can you say that? Well, because as much as we marvel at the fact that Jesus came and died for our sins, uh, there are a lot of people who worship uh, dead people. Uh, we worship a risen, living Savior. It is because of this reality that he rose from the dead on resurrection, well, it wasn't resurrection, resurrection Sunday, but that he rose from the dead, that we have hope, we have, we have a confident expectation of our own immortality with him. What, a, what an unbelievable morning it is. And so he has risen. He has risen indeed. He has risen indeed. So welcome, uh, boy, you know, a little stress here this morning. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Uh, we did not have internet until, what, 15 minutes ago. So we right in the midst of all of this, uh, God sovereign over that, and he worked the glitches out with a little help from Steve Parker. Thank you, brother. And so we come this morning and we ask that uh, if you are uh, in any need, church family members, if you're in need, would you please make sure you're communicating with us? Uh, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs. Uh, if you have loved ones or uh, friends, neighbors, that we can help, please let us know. Uh, likewise, uh, I would just encourage uh, our church family to be faithful. You know, we look at in Acts 2 and we see the church was... Uh, Actually, they were selling things to care for one another. And, and so there are people who have needs. And please be generous if you have the opportunity to, because there are folks who've lost jobs and there are people who are really struggling in our church family. And we want to be able to care for one another. So please keep that in mind. And will you be dig diligent, not vigilant, diligent to look at your emails? Bill is faithful to communicate needs and and information uh, via internet uh, through email. So uh, if you do not have internet, which I know some people do not, and somehow you're seeing this message, uh, please give a call if you have need. So with that, I would ask Bill to come and bring us the first word, brother. Good morning, friends. We are glad that you are with us. We're glad for the few that are here with us in the building. We're grateful you're here. and. Uh, I want to invite you to stand with me this morning as we hear first word. And uh, Dwight has already uh, done this, but I'm going to do it again. He is risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. He is risen indeed. And this morning we hear first word from Isaiah chapter 43, where God speaks to the prophet and says this. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our only hope to pass through this world unscathed, unharmed, and come out on the other side better than when we began is through the resurrection power of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, it's in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit that I say grace and peace and mercy unto you. The Lord has greeted us. Let's worship him together. And this morning, you may be seated. And this morning, as we uh, come to worship, we would normally at this time sing triumphant resurrection songs of Easter uh, Sunday morning, Resurrection Day. And uh, we're not going to do that this morning because you'd have to hear my voice only. And I wouldn't do that to anyone that I care about. And so uh, we're going to uh, come before the Lord and we're going to give him thanks. Often we would come and we would confess our sin. But we've done that uh, dutifully on Monday, Thursday, and we've done that again on Good Friday. And so this morning, our prayer time of confession is going to be transformed into a prayer of thanksgiving as we give the Lord praise for his victory over our sin. So let's pray together. 
Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for what you have accomplished on our behalf. Lord, it is not of our own efforts. It's not of our own works. It's not of our own brilliance. It's not because of anything that we have done or said or think, but it is because of your grace and your mercy. Lord, we, 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 we say that we are imperfect and we need a savior and you have shown yourself to be that savior, the Holy One of Israel, our savior. And so, Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. And Lord, all the needs that we have, you know what they are. You know what our brokenness looks like. You know if it's, if it's emotional or spiritual or physical or financial. No matter what the challenges that we face in this world, we bring them all before you and we lay them at the foot of your throne and we say that you and you alone are the God who's big enough to speak into our life, to, to see the power of resurrection lived out in our life. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we give you thanks and praise. And we glorify your name. Amen. This time, Dwight's going to come and read uh, from uh, John chapter 20. The passage of scripture this morning will be John chapter 20. So we invite you to turn it there. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping in to look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which Jesus had, had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. For as yet, they had not understood the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Ramoni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascended to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went out and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Thus ends the reading of the word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will last forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, I. Before I come to the Lord in, in prayer and ask him to bless our time of uh, looking into the word, uh, just a word of, uh, to those who are watching online. Um, some of you may uh, want to revisit the message. Uh, some of you may want to share it with a friend. 
Uh, you're, if you're watching it now, you apparently have uh, Facebook uh, live because uh, that's the only way you can live stream or the only way I've figured out how to live stream is on Facebook. So if you're watching it at 10 a.m. or 10, 10 a.m. On, on Resurrection Sunday, it's because you have Facebook, but perhaps some of your friends don't. Um, uh, Ron asked me just a few minutes ago, how do, how do I give this to somebody else to, to watch? And uh, you do that by going to YouTube. YouTube, we have a YouTube channel. It's Sunrise Church, S-U-N, Sunrise Church McMinnville on the YouTube channel. And you can find uh, all of our uh, messages since our quarantine time has uh, begun. And we'll just continue to do this even after we return. So uh, welcome if you're listening online. We're grateful that you're here. And uh, we're great. I'm grateful that the people, the few that are gathered here are here because preaching to an empty room is uh, its just not very fun. Um, it's a lot more difficult. So with that, let's come before the Lord and ask him to bless our time. Lord, we give you thanks for the revelation of Jesus Christ that we heard from John chapter 20. Lord, we ask that you yourself would be our teacher and our guide. May you guide us into your word by your spirit so that we become your people, the people you call us to be. And to that end, Lord, I ask for a special gift, the gift of preaching upon by the Holy Spirit, for apart from your Holy, Holy uh, Spirit's guidance, I have nothing to add to your holy word. I pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So all winter, uh, since, uh, or I should say midwinter, since the beginning of the year, following uh, the Advent and Christmas season, uh, I've been preaching a sermon series entitled Living the Ethos of the Logos in a Pathos World. Now those are Greek terms uh, about Greek rhetoric that uh, most people don't use in their daily lives, but the truth is there's probably at least some connection to them that you are familiar with if you've never, even if you've never heard them in Greek before. Um, this has nothing actually to do with the Bible. It's just what the Greek uh, uh, rhetoricians back, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago discovered about how human beings come to know and experience anything. And they recognized that human beings come to knowledge and experience of things in life in three ways. They do it through, through ethos, logos, and pathos. And those words, ethos, logos, and pathos, are actually, they come into uh, English, like for example, logos actually is pretty close. Logos is the logic, it is the truth, it is the word, it is the expression of that which is so. That is the logos, the logic. And the pathos sounds uh, similar to our word for emotion, we call it passion. And so pathos, is about emotion and then ethos is the one that's uh, the most fur furthest away from our english word it actually means credibility right the ethos of something is 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 there veracity is it not only true but does it uh, claim to be true but does it show itself to be true and so when we even when i've entitled this sermon series living the ethos of the logos in a pathos world really what i'm talking about is living the credibility of the truth of Christianity in a highly emotional world. And that is our challenge. It's our challenge if uh, we call ourselves a Christian, whether we're a regular church goer, of course, these days, there are no regular church goers. I'm the only regular church goer. Well, Vicki's been here every week, and a few of you have been here every week, but there aren't any regular church goers. So we've kind of leveled that playing field, and perhaps that's a good thing, right? We can take those titles uh, away from people, those labels that we slap on people. Uh, one of the things that we've considered as we talk about living out the credibility of the Christian life, the truth of Christianity in, a, in an emotional world, is that um, too often Christians have failed to do so. And this has uh, led to some negative effects. And one of those negative effects is that uh, young people, uh, millennials specifically, are leaving the faith, they're leaving church, and they're not coming back. Last fall, uh, there was a, a, a study published by a nam, man named Dennis Cox, who said millennials are leaving religion and not coming back. Well, 
clearly Mr. Cox didn't need to be a research scientist to figure out that, uh, that millennials were leaving the church. Now, he, uh, that's just self-evident. If you go to most churches, they're filled with people who are 45 and older. And so we ask the question, where are our young people going? And yet Mr. Cox got a little too, uh, well, cocky, if I can borrow the phrase from his own name there. Um, and he said they're not coming back. Now, I don't know how he knows that, because some of them very well could come back. In fact, I believe that uh, those who the Lord has put his mark on, his seal on, uh, those who he has done their work, the work in their heart and in their mind will indeed return. I can, I can show you all kinds of Christians who for a season walked away from Christ, but didn't walk in the faith, and they're walking with Christ again today. Can I get an amen? Right? A lot of us have uh, followed that trail. So uh, we can't say that millennials aren't coming back, but we can say that a lot of them aren't here. But why? Well, there's lots of reasons. In fact, there's as many reasons as there are people who leave. So it's uh, be too simplistic to boil it down to one or two things, but um, there's uh, some categories that they fall into for sure. Uh, they, they, they fall into categories such as um, they think people have experienced religion and specifically Christianity is emphasizing rules over relationships. And absolutely, that's the case. Uh, I think a lot of us have, were raised in a, in a church atmosphere where um, there was a, a, a lot of attention paid to your human performance and the rules that you had to live up to, things that you were supposed to do or things you weren't allowed to do. But all of those things were elevated over the importance of relationships, not only a relationship, a vertical relationship with God, but even the quality uh, the truth relationship of the people uh, that we go to church with. Or perhaps it's a, it was judgment over justice. People can look and say, well, that person doesn't belong in the church because they're not good enough. They don't look good enough. They don't act good enough. They maybe, might, maybe look funny or smell funny or, or, or they, their, their behaviors aren't good enough. And so the church too often has made judgments, uh, even though they weren't willing to put themselves out there to make sure that uh, justice was done to the least and to the lost. Some people have left religion because they say uh, Christianity has placed superstition over science. Even what we talk about today, the resurrection of Jesus, they would say, well, that's just medically impossible. Dead people don't get up and walk after three days. And they call us science deniers. And so they've checked out of the church. Or perhaps there's mistreatment over mercy. People that Jesus had mercy toward, but the church doesn't show mercy toward that group of people. And the young people have seen that. They've seen the hypocrisy. They've seen the abuse. And they say, I don't want any part of that. And then there's what I call the isms, whether that's materialism or individualism or emotionalism. And boy, there's sure a lot of that in North American evangelical Christianity. There's some people that when they go to church, it's a contest to see how good they can look right? They're dressed to the nines. They're flaunting it. Look how good I look, or look how wealthy I am, or we park our Mercedes Benz up front because we want to show that, after all, if you, if you live right, God will bless you more. And you're shown that because of the material goods that come into your life. And, and young people see that and they say, I don't want any part of that, or just pure emotionalism that you can whip yourself up into a frenzy and you can believe what you want and you can claim something to be true, even if it's obviously not. And those of us who are Christians would say, boy, I've certainly seen that in the church. And so these are just some of the reasons that, uh, to, uh, that uh, young people have checked out. And for too many young people and some people that are not so young, it all adds up to a religion that leaves a bitter taste in their spiritual mouth. And they say, thank you, but no thank you. I've heard people say things like this. You have to force a religion like Christianity on someone because no one would accept it otherwise. And then they go back in world history where uh, some nation like Spain or Italy or England or France sent their missionaries and their soldiers overseas and they converted people at the point 
of a spear or a sword or a gun. And of course, I don't know one person, I don't personally know one person who would defend any of that as biblical Christianity. And to the degree that it is our fault, if it's our fault that young people are leaving, it's because the church has generally failed to live out the credibility of the, and the truth of Christianity in a highly emotional world. We have failed to live the ethos of the logos in a pathos world. And hence our purpose and our challenge in this sermon series, to challenge ourselves and say, am I living the credibility of the truth claims of who Jesus is so that the world around me can see that? And it's an uphill battle in our world today. Sure it is, of course it is. And yet I believe that if you give the story and the message of Jesus a new and a fair hearing, you will discover a faith of credibility, a faith of truth and of meaningful emotion that gives us purpose and fulfillment as the people we were created to be. And there's no time like Passion Week, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, to point people to the person and to the power of Jesus, who he was, what he came to do, what he said, what he did, and what he promised when he left. There's no time like this time. And so through this past week, we have heard the claims in Saw again from the scriptures, the claims that Jesus made about himself, that he was divine, that he claimed to be one with the Father, that he claimed to be God himself. Wow, that's an incredible claim. We see his teaching and we hear what he said, what he called his people to do, what he commanded, the new commandment to love one another, to love others more than they love self. And then Jesus showed us what that looked like. He fulfilled his work by showing us exactly what self-sacrificial love looks like as we see his sacrifice on the cross. He didn't love himself more than he loved us. He placed our needs above his own. After all, if he's one with God, if he is God, if he's one with the Father, then he had the power to avoid the cross, but he willfully, willingly took it on and sacrificed himself for our sake. Amen. But this is perhaps where some would say, aha, see, Pastor, death and resurrection. See, that's what we're talking about. Superstition over science. There's no way that dead people walk again. There's no way that someone dead for three days in the grave gets up, breathes again, and life comes back into them. That doesn't happen. So that's just another example of superstition over science. To that I say there are good logical, and I claim that they are logical reasons to believe in the Jesus death and in his resurrection. And by the way, it's important that we actually believe in his death. It's not just about his resurrection. Of course, he can't raise from the dead if he was never dead. But of course, there's lots of theories that maybe Jesus was just thought to be dead. And so his resurrection was just kind of the swoon theory. He fainted for a while. He laid in a nice cool tomb. He rose. He woke up uh, feeling better a few days later, and he stumbled out of the tomb. Because after all, people left for dead in a coma can move a rock that take, weighs 10,000 pounds, right? Wrong. No, there are logical reasons to believe that Jesus physically, biologically, medically was dead and pronounced dead. And then there are good logical reasons to believe that he got up, resurrected from the dead, and walked out of the grave. On Good Friday, we saw that Jesus really died. It's in John chapter 19. And I'm not going to go back there and look at all. If, you're, if you weren't with us, you can either go back on the YouTube channel and watch that passage. 
uh, in John chapter 19, where I discussed it. But it's when uh, they went out to, uh, to take them off the cross because they didn't want these dead bodies to be hanging on the cross during the Sabbath, the high holy day at the end of Passover. And so they said, let's go out and let's break the legs of those who are crucified so that they will suffocate quicker and they will die. And when they, they did that to the two thieves, that were crucified on each side of Jesus, when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. And so they didn't break his legs as the scriptures said they would not. And then they thrust a spear, a soldier thrust a spear in the side of Jesus and from the wound in his side spilled forth an issue of blood and water, the separation of the blood and the plasma that happens after death. Now, this is a, a fisherman John, who writes this, this is not a medical doctor. This isn't the, the, the medical doctor, uh, Luke, that traveled with the Apostle Paul. This was a fisherman who says this. It's his testimony. It's his witness. He's not making this up. Under the penalty of a threat to his own life, he proclaims that what he saw and he goes out of his way in John chapter 19 to say, this was my testimony. I know that it was true. I saw it with my own eyes. And this issue of blood and water, the plasma separating, that only happens when there is biological death. And so we know that Jesus was really dead. So what are the reasons to believe in the resurrection? Even if you say, okay, yeah, so what? Jesus was dead. But resurrection, really? Why would I necessarily believe in resurrection? And today we're gonna to take a look into the scriptures and see two things specifically. Number one, we're gonna see that confusion around this is normal. That those that were closest to Jesus, the people that knew Jesus, that loved Jesus, that trusted Jesus, that followed Jesus, they were confused about his resurrection. And so if you're confused about resurrection, I say to you, that's simply normal. That's the way things go. Of course you're confused. Belief may come to us quickly. Some of us heard a message and we went, wow, that's powerful. That's transformative. That changed my life. It can come quickly, but guess what? For other people, it grows over time. Some of you struggle and wrestle with it. And some of us really aren't sure. And, 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 and we think about it. We say, I, you know, I don't want to be duped so easily. I don't, want to, I don't want to be just a lemming. I don't want to be one of the sheeple who just follows along and, and, and doesn't think for themselves. I want to be independent and intelligent. And to you, I say, that's good. That's good. But belief even for those who are careful, belief. If one believes, it is because that belief has been initiated by God himself. So let's see what the Bible reveals about the resurrection of Jesus. Dwight already read this to us, but I'm looking at John chapter 20, looking at uh, verses uh, one and following. And what it says there in verse one is, uh, now on the first day of the week, so that's Sunday, um, in the Jewish calendar, the first day of the week was a work day. And they just lived their life. Uh, for those in the Christian calendar and in our culture, Sunday's uh, the, the last day of the weekend, right? It's the, it's the day that we all dread coming to an end because we all gotta go back to work on Monday morning. Well, we used to have to go back to work on Monday morning. Now we just have to get up for the 30 second commute to the coffee pot and to the sofa or to our desk where we can get on our laptop and work from home. But Sunday in the first day of the week as the first day of the week in the Jewish calendar is because Saturday was the Sabbath. It's the last day, the seventh day that God rested. And the only reason that Christians worship on the first day of the week is because it's the first day of the week that Jesus raised from the dead. And if we get our identity from him, then we're basing our worship, our public corporate worship on the first day of the week. Now, some of you would say, perhaps some out there would say, well, you know, I still think we should honor the Sabbath. Well, and I think that, that every day we should worship God with our whole life. 
our mind, body, spirit, all that we do, no matter what we say, everything we do, we should give glory and honor to the Lord. But that's a different conversation for another day. It says on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Now, as I read, I'm going to invite you to listen for repeated words and ideas and themes. So she comes to the tomb early while it's still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, which was John, who is being showing humility by not pointing his own name out. And the one, the one whom Jesus loved, which is John, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. And both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, uh, you're a longtime resident of Sunrise Church. You, as you know, this is where I make fun of Peter being slow, fat, and old. And this is, this is where the young, younger, thinner, healthier John outraces him. And I even think that John wrote this in here. It's just kind of a jab to Peter. It's like, yeah, sure, you got your own gospel. John Mark went around following you, listening to your sermons, and he wrote the gospel of Mark. That's your gospel. Here's mine, and I'm just giving you a little elbow here, giving you a little bit of jazz. So, you know, I don't really have any proof for that, but, you know, it's, I like it. Um, so the, the main repeated words in the first four verses is the word tomb. Of course it is, right? Of course it's the main tomb. It points to what everyone's expectation was on that day. They had laid Jesus in the tomb. The last time they saw him, he was dead. Just a few days prior, they put him there and they left him there. So they expected him to be there. Everything, the, the, the Passover has come and gone. The Sabbath has come and gone. They now are at the first day of the week where they can resume the work of their life. And because their master, their teacher has died, they're going to go where? To the tomb. Let's look and see how many times this key word tomb actually shows up in the opening section. And if you go counting through the first eight verses, that's talking primarily about uh, Peter and John coming to the tomb, we find it, if you're listening uh, live stream right now, just take a guess, what, how many times do you think you find it in the first eight verses? You find it seven times. The, the word tomb is discovered seven times. And I looked at that, and once again, I was amazed at the word of God. And I go and I say, could that be possible? And so I went back to the Greek text, and I forced myself to find that Greek text, in the Greek text, that word for tomb, which is uh, it's the same word we get memorial from, right? It's uh, like the memorial like you put on a gravestone uh, comes from the Greek word for tomb. And um, uh, sure enough, I found it seven times. Now, why is that significant? Because seven is the biblical number of wholeness and completion. In other words, it is, it's important that it shows up seven times because they completely expected Jesus to be dead. Nobody went to that tomb that morning expecting to find it empty. In fact, most of the disciples didn't go to the tomb. Some women went there, Mary Magdalene and some others, that's when she came back and she said, we found it empty. So John's only telling us about her experience, but there were other women with her. She comes back to Peter and John and says, we found the tomb empty. And then that's what motivates them to go to the tomb. They have no intention of going to the tomb. Why would we go to the tomb? The tomb is just where Jesus' body is. Our, our, our teacher is dead. Everything about my life is shot. I've de devoted my whole life to this guy for three years, and now he's gone and buried. So why would I even go to the tomb? But Mary goes, and she finds it empty. Death 
was the overwhelming expectation of everyone on that Sunday morning. So when the disciples arrive at the tomb, they are rightly confused. Peter and John run. John gets there first. And it says on verse 5, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Now we know that they would take the body that was, had died and they would anoint it with uh, myrrh and aloes and other spices. And then they would wrap the body like, like a mummy, right? This is mummification. And so they would wrap the body tight. The arms would be wrapped individually and then they would be wrapped to the sides. And verse 5 says, but he did not go in. So John gets to the tomb. He looks in. He sees the linen cloths lying there. These are the linen cloths that were wrapped around the body of Jesus, and now they're just in a heap. They're in a pile. And verse 6 says, when Simon Peter came and followed him, and he went into the tomb, the tomb of death, the place of death. And he saw the linen cloths lying there. So they both see the linen cloths lying there. And verse 7 is interesting. It says, and the face cloth, which had been put over Jesus' head. Now, the face cloth was you not only wrap the body like a mummy, but then you would take a shroud, a, a, a cloth, like a handkerchief, like a large handkerchief, and you put it over the face and the head of the dead person. And in verse 7 it says, the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up and placed by itself. Now, here's one of the reasons that I believe that Jesus really raised from the dead. Some say, well, his disciples stole the body because they want to maintain this story of Christianity. So they just broke in and took the body. Well, never mind, it was guarded by Roman soldiers. Never mind that they were fearful and hiding away in their homes. Never mind that they had cowered because their whole life had been upset. They somehow are now going to be conniving enough to, in the midst of that emotion of the death of their, their, their leader, mastermind a scheme to distract Roman soldiers that guarding the stone, then move a 10,000 pound stone out of the way and rob the body. But not only did they do that, but as they stripped the body of the, if you're going to steal the body, why would you take all the mummified strips off of it? Why would you take the linen claws off it? And even, even more than that, if, if you thought that Jesus woke up and somehow untangled himself, even though his arms were tied down after being beaten up and left for dead for three days, and he just simply escaped, why would anyone fold the cloth that was over his face before they leave? If you were going to steal the body, you would go in, you'd grab the body, and you would take off. Or if you raised from uh, the coma and you came back to life and you somehow got all those, you would have just staggered out of the tomb. You wouldn't have taken the time to fold up the cloth and lay it by itself. And so verse 8 says, when the other disciple, that's John, when he had reached the tomb, he had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and he believed. Now that's interesting. He saw and he believed. But what did he believe? What did he believe? Well, he believed that the tomb was empty. That's what he believed. They believed that Jesus was gone. He was no longer there. But gone where? Well, what, was the, what was the significance of that for them? Because in verse 9 it says, For as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must raise from the dead. So he believed that Jesus was gone, but he did not understand that it was resurrection. And in verse 10 it says, then the disciples went back to their homes. They went back into hiding. They locked themselves away. So the disciples go away baffled, perhaps a little bit hopeful. I mean, Jesus is gone, so we don't really know where he is. Uh, is he dead? Well, I don't know. He, all I know is he's gone. Uh, they're perhaps a little bit hopeful, but they're certainly confused. 
They're definitely confused about resurrection. Now we know from verse 19 that Dwight read to us that they were fearful, right? You're looking at your Bible and you'll just jump down to verse 19. They're still, they're in their homes, they're locked away behind the clothes, they're fearful. They're fearful that the, the, the authorities that came and took Jesus and crucified him are coming for them next. So all that to say, if the people who were the closest to Jesus, that loved Jesus the most, that followed Jesus, that knew him best, if they were confused about resurrection, if you're confused about resurrection, that's all right. That's actually normal. Now maybe, maybe you grew up in a church that just wanted to jam the, 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 the Bible facts down your, your throat, and so no one ever gave you the permission to think about that and wonder about it, and I'm telling you, the people who were the closest to Jesus were confused. So if you're confused, that's okay. Amen. But then what happens next is absolutely, it is countercultural. It is a paradigm shift. It is, uh, it is stereotype breaking. It's astounding. It is counterintuitive. What happens next in this story blows away our preconceived notions of what should have happened. It is so unique that it points to the resurrection as most likely being true. Now, what am I talking about? Well, for three years, Jesus has basically spent every day, every hour, every minute, every second with his disciples. He has gathered these men around him, 12 of them, though one has fallen away and betrayed him, that's Judas. He has taught them, he has challenged them, he has shaped them, he has commissioned them. They are his closest friends, they are his family. He even said when his mother and brothers sent for him to come back home because he's kind of going crazy in what he's teaching, he said, who are my mother, my brother, and my sisters? But those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus superseded his biological connection to his own family, and he connected it with his disciples. But when the resurrection comes, to whom does he reveal himself first? Verse 11 says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. So John and Peter, they come and they look and they see these claws are gone, and the fo everything's folded up, and then they go back home. But Mary stays there. She's outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And again, tomb is mentioned two more times because she still expects Jesus to be there because he's dead. See, many people who see themselves as socially aware, perhaps well-educated, rational, thoughtful people, they're concerned about social justice. These folks often object, object to Christianity because they find it chauvinistic or arcane or closed-minded or oppressive. But in reality, a fair reading of the New Testament in its cultural context, if you look at what it actually says, what was written then and there in that day, you would find that it was groundbreakingly inclusive. It was diverse. It was proclaiming liberation for women, for minorities, for the poor. And here in John, we see a perfect example of that. Who does Jesus reveal himself to? Who does he reveal himself first to after raising from the dead? Does he reveal himself to men, the men he knew so well that he traveled with, his closest friends? No. Does he reveal himself to the wealthy? Does he go to the power structure? Does he go to the high priest? Does he go to the governor? Does he go back to Pilate? No. He doesn't go to all the power structures of society and culture. Rather, he reveals himself to a woman and one that happened to be socially rejected one who had uh, seven demons cast out of her, one who was spiritually desperate, an at-risk person. He reveals the resurrected Savior first to the lost and to the least of his culture. If someone in the first century wanted to make up a new religion that would be accepted by the majority of their culture, 
They wouldn't have chosen resurrection. And they certainly wouldn't prove resurrection by revealing it to a woman first. Bypassing all the power structures and going to the people who are rejected in their culture. A woman couldn't even testify in court. So why would you reveal yourself to a woman? She can't do you any good. Unless Jesus turns upside down the priorities of the culture. Amen. So those who say that Christianity is chauvinistic and oppressive, well, friends, they're either simply ignorant of the facts, they're ill-informed, or they're willfully blind. Those are the choices. They may see injustice in Christianity by Christians behaving badly. That's happened throughout history. I'm not defending anybody that's done that. But they don't see injustice in Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. So what was this woman's experience with the risen Christ? Verse 12 says, she stoops and looks inside. Verse 12 says, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain. One at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, her woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. The dominant expectation in Mary's mind even as she sees and talks to angelic beings and comes face to face with Jesus is the expectation of the tomb. And the expectation of the tomb is still death. She, her response is, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. Mary still expected Jesus to be laying dead in that tomb, or if not in that tomb, then somewhere else. And Jesus said to her, woman, verse 15, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? So picture this, right? Mary stoops inside. She looks and sees a couple guys in white, shining brightly, having a conversation. Then, then this other person behind her says, what are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, says verse 15, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And then you can imagine her turning back to the conversation. Because even now, she's looking Jesus in the eye, and she does not recognize him. She doesn't know who he is because she's still expecting death. Because death is definitive. Death is final. The tomb is permanent. And so if you reject Jesus because you believe him dead, then I understand that. I get it. I don't think you're a fool for thinking that dead people stay dead. But verse 16 says, Jesus said to her, Mary. So Mary has turned back because she hears her name and she turned and saw him again and said to him in Aramaic, Rabona, which means teacher. So what changed between verse 15 and verse 16? She had a conversation, actually a longer one. She had a face-to-face -face conversation with Jesus, and she doesn't recognize him, and then she does. So what changed? Jesus called her by name, Mary. Knowing Jesus doesn't happen by mere physical recognition. It doesn't happen by mere physical evidence. So if we could prove that someone raised from the dead, Jesus isn't the only one to raise from the dead. People have had afterlife experiences and they come back and they tell us about it and right before they go into the light, they come back. Or Jesus wasn't the only person who comes back from the dead in the Bible. 
right? Just a few days earlier, the reason people were flocking on, on Palm Sunday to, to welcome him into Jerusalem is because he had raised Lazarus from the dead. So resurrection of the dead, even though it was rejected by the Sadducees, uh, is, this has happened now twice in a week and a half. But knowing Jesus doesn't happen by mere physical evidence. To recognize and to know the truth of Jesus, he must call us by name. You see, many Easter messages try to convince unbelievers that they ought to believe. And it's the day that Christians talk their unbelieving friends and family into coming to church and maybe they're going to hear something that will convince them this time because I've been preaching at them for months and they won't believe me. Maybe Pastor Bill can do it. Well, I've got some disappointing news for you. Well, number one, there aren't many people in church and they already already believe. But I'm not concerned about making unbelievers into believers. What? You don't care about evangelism? I didn't say that. I said I... I'm not concerned about me making unbelievers into believers because I can't do that. What it takes for someone to become a believer is they got to be convicted to, that they uh, are a sinner and that they need a savior and that Jesus is that savior and what he did on the cross sets them free and that they put their faith in what he has done. That's how you become a Christian. And that happens not by, uh, not by Pastor Bill or anybody else. That happens by the Holy Spirit of God. The really important question is this, is Jesus calling your name? Is Jesus calling you by name? You see, it's God who initiates relationship. We do not come to God and call out his name. Oh, we do that. Some people are just disappointed because after all, uh, I called on God and he wasn't there. Oh, you mean you ignored God your whole life until you really needed him, then you called on him because he didn't show up? At your snap of the finger, on your demand, you're angry, you're in resentment, resistance, and revenge with God because he doesn't work on your timetable? Oh, okay, you seem like a reasonable person. No, we don't come to God and call on his name. Rather, God comes to us and he calls us by our name because he's the one who initiates relationship. After all, what's his name? His name is God. Well, that's his title. His name is Yahweh, but or Yeshua, or Jesus, or Joshua, or Jesus, or or, or, or or our God saves. His name is lots of things, but his title is God. That means he's the supreme authority. He's the one that, that determines. He's the one who calls. And this is the way it has always been with God's people. It's what I read at, at the beginning of the service in first word. But now thus saith the Lord. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God places his claim on his people, and he does it in a personal way. Jesus calls us by name. Well, I've never heard my name. Did you actually hear the word Bill? Hey, Bill. No, no. That's not the point. Don't play games. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Spirit of God reaching into our heart and our mind and our soul and calling us. It's him reading our mail. It's him revealing to us what he, we know to be true. And he shows us in such a powerful way that we know that he knows us. If you leave here today changed, into a believing Christian, you won't do, do so because of your spouse or because of your friends or because I want you to. If you are truly changed, it will only happen because God has called you by name. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Jesus still, he, he doesn't just lump himself in with his disciples. Now they're, they're less of a group because he's identified himself as one with the Father and he's showing he's my Father, but he's also your Father. And he's my God, but he's also your God. So how does Mary respond to this instruction? How does she respond to this powerful encounter with the risen Jesus? She does it with obedience and submission. 
Verse 18 says Mary Magdalene went, right? She didn't give them lip service. She didn't say, but I want to do that. She didn't talk. She, she didn't, no, nothing is recorded that she said to Jesus beyond that. Mary Magdalene went and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. And so the disciples who had returned to their homes and they were in hiding received the message, but they were still fearful and still confused. And we see that in verse 19, right? And on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the same day, the door being, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. So they're afraid. Mary has already come and she said, I've seen the Lord, but they're back home and they're still locked away. They didn't, they didn't hear about the resurrected Jesus and throw out the, open the door and say, hey, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. We don't need to be afraid anymore. No, they're still confused. They're still bewildered. And Jesus comes and he stands amongst them. In other words, he passed through a locked door. Or he, he just appeared there. We're not sure how that happened. And he says, peace be with you. By the way, you don't know, you think that's superstition over science? That Jesus just appeared in their midst or he walked through the door? Well, you tell me, friend, what is a resurrected body that was dead for three days? What can it do when it raises up? Well, that's ridiculous. It didn't happen. What if it did happen? What would it be capable of doing? Verse 20 says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. See, this again is not superstition. They're not seeing a ghost. They're, he's showing them the, the nail marks in his hands and the, 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 the hole in his side. And he's saying to them, I am the resurrected Jesus. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So now they see it, that he's not a ghost, but they actually see the wounds of Jesus and they know that it's really the resurrected Christ. And here we find another logical reason to believe in the resurrection. You see, they all agreed that they encountered the risen Jesus. They're all there. You so people have hallucinations. One time after my grandfather, uh, my, my, I, I grew up living next door to my grandparents. And I would go over and I would mow their grass. And I had a, we had a, my father had a, a John Deere riding lawnmower, John Deere 110. And I'd go over and I would mow the grass. And my grandfather, who was sick with emphysema, would stand in the house and he would lean on the windowsill and he would watch me mow the grass. And he died when I was 14 years old. And um, a week or so, or maybe a month, I don't know. He died in August or July, July, I think, maybe August. Um, a month or so later, I go over and I'm mowing the grass and I'm whipping around. The and I, you know, now grandpa isn't watching me, so I know I can drive a little faster on that lawnmower. And I look up and lo and behold, I saw my dead grandfather in the window watching me mow the grass. But I didn't think anything about it because that's what grandpa always does. And so I just whipped around again, and then it dawns on me, hey, Grandpa's watching me know the grass. And I look back to that window, and what do you think I saw? Absolutely nothing. Because people have hallucinations. There's the mind's eye that it has memory. This is what I always saw. Do I really believe that my dead grandfather was watching me mow the grass? No, I don't. I actually don't believe that was the case. I think it was just what human, the human mind plays tricks on us. But guess what? Group hallucinations aren't a thing. When you get a bunch of us in a group and we see something, what do we say? You know, when you're out, uh, when, when, when you're out deer hunting with all your buddies and you're sitting around the campfire at night and you're smoking a cigar. By the way, ladies, we're not going there to go uh, fishing or hunting. We're going out there to smoke cigars because you don't want us to do it at home. So that's what's happening. And we're sitting around the campfire and we look up and we see a shooting star. What do you say? Did you see that? Did I see what? Oh, a shooting star. When you see something out of the ordinary, what do you say? You, lay, you look around to the group and you say, did you see that? And the reason you do it is because you want to know that you're not having a hallucination. 
And if your friend says to you, yeah, I saw the shooting star, you're like, wow, that was cool. If they're like, no, I didn't see it. That's just because they're not paying attention or whatever, too much tequila or something else. I don't know. But if you saw Jesus in a group who was dead and then you saw his scale, his, his, the nail marks in his hands and in his side and you said, did you see that? And they said, yes. And they all agreed that they had encountered the risen Christ. How do I know that? Well, here's the real compelling reason to accept the resurrection because there were 12 disciples that Jesus had. Of course, by this time, Judas has betrayed Jesus and hanged himself. So we're down to 11, only 11 remain. And of those 11 men, all but one, the author of this gospel, John, all of them die a torturous martyr's death to defend the truth of the resurrection. Why would you go to a torturous death? Well, how torturous is it? So they got, they got their head chopped off. No, no, Thomas, the apostle who traveled to India, church tradition tells us he was skinned alive and boiled in oil. And he would not recant. He would not back off from the truth that he had seen Jesus raised from the dead. That's doubting Thomas. That's how he died. These confused men who cowered and hid behind locked doors are all transformed into brave warriors of truth that cannot be silenced to the point of their very heinous and hideous, horrendous deaths. Amen. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And here we see Jesus in John's gospel, giving the authority of church discipline to his apostles. A lot of us don't like that, that someone could determine our sins forgiven. I don't want a man sitting in judgment of me. Well, I don't want a man sitting in judgment of me either. But of course, this isn't just about men sitting in judgment of people. This is about those who received the Holy Spirit. That this, the, the, the work of God himself is doing this, not just the opinion of some people. So what about you, friend? Do you reject Christianity? Do you reject a risen Jesus? What do you think about Jesus raising from the dead? If you reject him, what's at the heart of that rejection? Is it because you've seen Christians behaving badly? You've seen people do horrible things in the name of God. I've seen it too. I can't stand it either. It makes me, I suspect, even more angry than it makes you. Are you sick and tired of seeing rules over relationship or judgment over justice? Yeah, me too. But is that what you have seen in Jesus himself? Did you see that in Jesus? Or did you see that in me? Because if you see that in me, don't judge Jesus by me. Because I'm imperfect. I never said I was perfect. In fact, I'm pretty quick to announce that I'm a broken sinner saved by God's mercy and grace. Have you seen Jesus elevate rules over relationship? Judgment over justice? You know, I have a friend who has this on his email. Every email I get from him it says, at the end of it, after he signs off, it says, man prefers to believe what he prefers to be true. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's profound. Are your reasons for rejecting Jesus actually true? And what if they're not really true? Maybe you should just reconsider them again. Maybe it's been 10 or 20 years since you've considered what you believe about that. We all came here today from a different perspective and a different viewpoint. And maybe you're not rejecting Jesus, but maybe you're just confused at all about it all. Maybe parts of you really want to believe that, but you know, after all, it's resurrection. It's like, I don't want superstition over science. 
Maybe you just want to hear Jesus call you by name. Maybe you want that. Maybe you need that. You see, just like Mary Magdalene, when we hear Jesus call our name, the right response is what she did, submission and obedience. At Sunrise Church, we believe that all human beings are guilty. We're all sinful, we're all broken. But God the Father sent God the Son to die on the cross for the complete forgiveness of our sins. And so he took our guilt upon himself and he paid the penalty of that on the cross. And so it's out of a heart of gratitude that we're called to submit to him and obey him. Or another way we say is sin, salvation, service, that we're sinners and God's work of salvation through Jesus' work on the cross was given us as a gift, a free gift that we can't earn or deserve. And that the right response then is, is, is out of a heart of gratitude again to, to serve him. And what is that service? Well, we believe that our service is to live out the credibility and the truth of Jesus' death, his resurrection, and to do that in the midst of a highly emotional world that's very confused with lots of mixed messages. And that is our worship. That's our walk with him. That's our witness to the people around us. So what do you believe about Jesus? That's the question. What do you believe about Jesus? Is he calling your name? Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Father, that you have met us and you have done your work of grace in our life through the work of Jesus on the cross. You have revealed yourself to us as the risen Savior, not just the one who went to the cross to pay the penalty of our sin and atone for the sins of your people, but you had victory over sin and over death and over hell when you had victory over the grave. And so, Father, we, we praise you for a risen Lord, a risen Savior. Lord, I pray for my friends. I pray for my friends that are still rejecting Jesus. I, I, I just pray that they would reconsider. They would think again about why they're rejecting. Because if they're rejecting Jesus because of some Christian somewhere who did something wrong or morally wrong or evil or, or hurtful, that's not Jesus. Help them to think again about who Jesus is and what he came to do. And Lord, I, I pray too for those of us who you're calling their name even now. You're calling them and they know that in their heart and in their mind, you're calling them because your hand is on them and that you, the Holy One of Israel, are their Savior. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we go, I want to leave you with last word. And last word this morning is in that same chapter, which I've been uh, referring to throughout this, uh, this sermon series, is uh, what we find in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you, you may have life in his name. Amen. And thank you for being with us today.